Okay, in this video we're going to look at a special type of function between two groups called a homomorphism. So the definition goes like this. So we want to start with two groups, G and H, and we say that a map phi from G to H is called a homomorphism if it preserves the group law. In other words, if we do phi of XY, we get phi of X times phi of Y. The important thing to notice is that in these parentheses over here, the operation between X and Y is given by the group G, whereas over here, the operation between phi of X and phi of Y is given by the group operation on H. And so this has to hold for all X and Y in G. So for the remainder of this video, I want to look at some examples of homomorphisms and I want to prove uh, an important proposition about some really elementary general properties of homomorphisms. So maybe the first example I want to look at is let's take phi from the integers to G where G is any group. So notice I can actually construct a homomorphism from Z to any group and I can construct it in the following way. Let's say phi of n equals G to the n where little g in G is fixed. And so that turns out that that's a homomorphism because it's easy to check that phi of m plus n, so notice that's our operation happening over here in the integers, is equal to uh, g to the m plus n, which is the same thing as g to the m times g to the n by exponent rules, which work in groups, um, but that's equal to phi of m times phi of n. So notice over here I'm using an operation of addition because we know exactly what group we're working with. We're working with the integers with addition as the operation, but here I'm using multiplication to mean a more abstracted operation that's happening on this general group here. Okay, good. Now we could set G to be kind of whatever we want and um, that is going to give us a lots of examples like this. Like we could let G be a dihedral group and maybe little g be one of the rotations. Or G could be a symmetric group and little g could be one of the elements of uh, the symmetric group. And so on and so forth. We've got a lot of choices there. Okay, so the next example I want to look at uh, is the following one. So let's take phi from GL to R. So let's recall what that is. That's all two by two matrices with non-zero determinant. And let's take that to R times. And let's recall what that is. <coughs> that is all real numbers except for zero. And this forms a group under multiplication. And now what we'll do is we'll take phi of A equals the determinant of A. And this determinant function is actually a homomorphism. And that is because if you do phi of A times B, no, notice what's going on over here is matrix multiplication. That is determinant A, B, but that's equal to determinant A times determinant B by um, linear algebra rules. Um, but that's equal to phi of A times phi of B. So let's read this. The left hand side we've got matrix multiplication in here and then on the right hand side we've got multiplication of non-zero real numbers. Okay great. Now I want to do one more. Let's take uh, phi uh, from let's say maybe R with addition, so I'll just say R, and then we can take this uh, to the circle group T, which is some called, sometimes called S1, which is all of the complex numbers uh, where their modulus is 1. In other words, it's everything in the complex plane along the unit circle, and now we could say phi of x equals e to the i x. And then again, we can check that's a homomorphism because phi of x plus y. So over here, our operation is addition. So that's equal to e to the i x plus y. But then again, we know something about exponent rules, which is going to allow us to write that as e to the x, e to the i y, like that. Which finally is going to allow us to write that as phi of x times phi of y. 
Okay, good. So we've got two, sorry, three nice examples of homomorphisms. I'll clean up the board. We'll state a proposition that uh, works with generalities involving homomorphisms and prove some of the items of this proposition. Okay, so I'll state and prove these one at a time. So our general setup is going to be phi, a function from G1 to G2, which are both groups, is a homomorphism. Then the first thing that we want to prove is that if E1 in G1 is the identity of G1, then E2 is actually equal to phi of E1. In other words, the identity in G2 is the image of the identity in G1. So uh, let's see how that works. Okay, so let's let X be some arbitrary element in G1, and then notice we have the following um, few equations. So we have E1 times X equals X, and so this is because E1 is uh, in G1 is the identity. Okay, cool. But now notice we can apply phi to this, and we'll get phi of E1 X equals phi of x, but now notice that gives us phi of e1 times phi of x equals phi of x. Okay, great. But now, notice phi of x is an element of g2, so it has an inverse. So now let's left multiply this whole thing by phi of x quantity inverse. Now notice that's an element of G2. Again, because we know G2 is a group, so everything has an inverse. But if we left multiply both sides of the equation by that, that's going to give us phi of E1 on the right-hand side. And then on the left, sorry, on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we'll have phi of X times phi of X quantity inverse. But if you multiply something by its inverse, you get the identity, which is called E2. So that's the identity of G2. And so now notice, reading the extreme left and right hand side of the equation, we get that the identity of G1 is mapped to the identity of G2 under this homomorphism. Okay, I'll clean up the board, then we'll do another property. Okay, so the next property that we'll prove is that if we've got an element from G1 and we take its inverse and then apply phi, that's the same thing as applying phi and then taking its inverse. In other words, phi of x inverse is the same thing as phi of x inverted. Okay, good. So let's see how this goes. So we can do the following. We can notice that E1 equals X times X inverse. And so that is an equation that's happening in G1. But now we can apply phi to both sides of this. And notice we get E2, which is equal to phi of E1 by the last part. So that is just applying phi to this. But that's exactly equal to phi of X times phi of X inverse. Okay, so let's look at the left hand and the right hand side of this equation. And now we're going to left multiply by phi of x quantity inverse, which we know exists because that's an element from G2, which is a group. And that's going to give us phi of x quantity inverse on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we're just, just left with this term right here, which is phi of x inverse. Okay, which um, means that we have proven this statement right here. Okay, good. So I'll clean up the board and then we'll do one more. Okay, so the fourth property that we'll prove, notice we skipped three, but we'll have a summary at the end where we state it. It follows very similarly from all of these, and there's, it's nice to keep one for a homework problem. So if we have H2 is a subgroup of G2, or it could be a normal subgroup, then the pre-image of H2 under the map phi is a subgroup of G1, and also if it's normal, then um, the pre-image is also normal. So let's just do subgroup first. Um, so we're going to use the subgroup test in order to do this. So let's recall that um, if you have an arbitrary H, which is a subgroup of G, this is equivalent to for all X and Y in H, we know that X, Y inverse is in H. 
So that's what we'll do. So the first goal is to show that phi inverse H2 is a subgroup of G1. So let's uh, suppose that uh, X and Y are elements of phi inverse of H2. So they're in the pre-image of elements from H2, but that means that phi of X and phi of Y are elements uh, from H2. So that's just the definition of the pre-image. But we know that H2 is a subgroup of G2, which tells us that phi of X times phi of Y quantity inverse is an element of H2, again, applying the subgroup test. But now by um, the fact that phi is a homomorphism and then the property 2 that we just proved, we can put these together and we get phi of XY inverse is an element from H2. Again, that's because phi is a homomorphism. That allows us to combine these together after we bring the inverse inside, which is by property two that we just proved. But that's exactly the condition for xy inverse to be in H2. Sorry, in phi inverse of H2. Great. But let's see what we did. We supposed x and y were in phi inverse of h2, and we got xy inverse is in phi inverse of h2, but that means that the pre-image of h2 is a subgroup of g1, which is the first thing that we wanted to prove. So now I'll clean up the board and then we'll prove that if it's normal, then the pre-image is also normal. Okay, so now we want to show that normality is conserved under this pre-image operation. So we'll suppose that H2 is a normal subgroup of G2, and our goal is to prove that the pre-image of H2 under phi is a normal subgroup of G1. And just as a reminder, N is a normal subgroup of G, if and only if, well, there are a couple ways to write this down, but I think the most useful for the, this proof will be X, little n, X inverse is an element from in and that's true for all x in g and n in n. So notice this does not say that x in x inverse is equal to little n. That would be something about it being in the center. What it does say is it lands back in the subgroup n. Okay, so since we want to show that phi inverse H2 is a normal subgroup, that means we need to do this kind of calculation in this setting. So let's, in other words, take little n from phi inverse of H2, and then we'll take x from G1. Okay, great. But now, no, notice, let's look at the object x, little n, x inverse. And let's go ahead and apply phi to that. So if we apply phi to that, we're going to get phi of x times phi of n times phi of x quantity inverse. Again, because phi is a homomorphism. Okay, good. But notice that this is an element from H2, and that's because H2 is normal in G2. And uh, this fact that N is in the pre-image of H2 tells us that phi of N is itself in H2. So look at we, what we've done here. We've conjugated phi of N by phi of X. Great. And that the condition of that landing in H2 is equivalent to the condition of H2 being normal. Okay, great. But now if we read this part of the equation, so phi of X in X inverse is in H2. So that is equivalent to the statement X in X inverse is in phi inverse of H2. But Finally, if we look at the very beginning of this argument, which is n as an element of this pre-image, and then the very end of this argument, which is x n x inverse is an element of this pre-image, that is exactly the condition that we need for this pre-image of H2 to be a normal subgroup in G1. So we've proven this fourth condition.
Okay, good. So I'm going to clean up the board and then summarize everything that we've proved about homomorphisms in general. Okay, so let's look at a summary of these results that we've just established. So if E1 and G1 is the identity of G1, then E2 is equal to phi of E1 is the identity in G2. So we proved that one first. Next, we proved that if we have any element from G1, if we take its inverse, then apply phi, that's the same thing as applying phi and then taking the inverse. Next, we skip this one, but it goes pretty similarly to the other ones that we proved. If H1 is a subgroup of G1, then phi of H1 is a subgroup of G2. Now, the last one, which we did prove, said that if H2 is a subgroup of G2, then the pre-image of H2 under our map is a subgroup of G1. And furthermore, if H2 is a normal subgroup of G2, then the pre-image of H2 is a normal subgroup of G1. So this pre-image preserves the normality of the subgroup, but the map itself does not preserve the normality. It's very easy to find an example where the subgroup is normal, but the image of the subgroup is not normal. And we don't even really have to look that hard to find that. Um, we can do it really quick. Let's just say we have phi going from z to dn, and let's say phi takes n, sorry, maybe takes m to s to the m power. Great. So now notice that Z is most definitely normal in itself because it's the whole subgroup. But if you take the image of Z, you just get the cyclic subgroup generated by S. But it's really easy to check that the cyclic subgroup generated by S is in fact not normal in the dihedral group, except in very, very special cases. Okay, good. This is a good place to end this video.